Hello, anybody listening? Uh, my name is Steve Arney, representing the Friends of the Library, Marshall Public Library Oral History Project. And <clears throat> we're here today to talk to Dan Cruz. Uh, it's October 15th, 2024, a cold day, uh, exactly three weeks from Election Day. Wow, and uh, I think we'll be glad when that's all behind us. We will be, yes, we will be. So Dan, uh, let's get one question out of the way real quick. Uh, somebody listening may not be familiar with you or your name. So you're not related to Tom Cruise, are you? I wish I was because I would ask him for a loan, but no, uh, I'm not related to Tom. Um, not related to Caribbean Cruise either, well, so just a okay. flat old uh, Dan Cruise. Well, I thought we ought to straighten that out because there is a slight resemblance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> When's the last time you had your eyes checked there? Yeah, well, it's been a while. <laughs> well, why don't you tell us uh, where and when you were born and tell, talk about your parents and your siblings? Um, glad to. I was uh, born December 3rd, 1960. Uh, historically, that is when uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower was a lame duck president and before uh, John F. Kennedy took office. Um, I was born in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, my father was stationed at uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and that's where I was born. I'm the youngest out of six children. Uh, they were all born uh, from 1947 to about 1952, and then there was about an eight-year gap, and then I came along. Uh, so, uh, like I said, I'm the youngest of six, three boys, three girls. Uh, my oldest siblings uh, are the girls. It's uh, Janice, uh, Jennifer, and Jackie, and my brothers, uh, Donald, Daryl, and myself. My uh, father's name was uh, Clyde Cruz. Uh, he was a professional career Army uh, soldier. Uh, went into service in 1943 and got out in the uh, mid-1960s. My mother was a homemaker, and uh, they were married uh, about 19, oh gosh, 1947, right after the war. So um, I, I was part of that baby boomer generation that uh, was born from those, uh, what I call that depression era uh, <coughs> folk, you know, who went through the depression, went through World War II, and I was part of that, uh, the baby boomer generation. But uh, my mother was a homemaker and really did not start working um, until uh, probably in the late 1960s because in the early 1960s my mother and father divorced and um, uh, we were living at that time in Florida. My mother was from Jacksonville, Florida. My father was from Lake City, Florida and um, we had most of my brothers and sisters lived at various army bases and different places uh, in the south um, if, by the time I came along and then as I said my uh, folks divorced about 1964 and um, my three sisters and myself we came uh, with my mother we moved uh, to the north because my mother had a, a sister in Calumet City Illinois and uh, which is a south suburb of Chicago and uh, that's where I grew up um, my brother my sisters and brothers all probably all have a, uh, a southern lilt to their uh, when they talk and uh, me I have a Yankee lilt because of uh, growing up in the Chicago area so uh, like I said I was uh, born in 1960 so by the time I moved uh, to Calumet City I was about three three and a half years old so even though you were the youngest of six you were still part of the boomer yes the baby boomer yeah and I, I kind of what's interesting is that uh, you might say well that's a large family but uh, by the time the divorce happened and my uh, sisters uh, you know, went to high school and got out of high school. They all graduated in uh, 66, 67, and 1968. Uh, I, I kind of grew up, and you know, they left home. Some of them went back to Florida. Um, uh, I have a, my oldest sister uh, got married and moved to Germany because her husband was in the Air Force. But I kind of grew up as an only child. But uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm the youngest out of six children. So you grew up in Calumet City. Uh, what, was, what was your childhood like? I look back very fondly with my childhood. Um, I think Calumet City was a great place to grow up. Um, we were in the shadow of Chicago, uh, which we went down occasionally downtown. Our, our big city, Calumet City lies right along the border between Indiana and Illinois, and we were right next to Hammond, Indiana. So that was our big city <clears throat> we went to, and we could walk to Hammond. Um, and back in that day, 
if you went to Chicago, it'd be about a 30 minute trip uh, by bus or you, you drove down there. But five miles south of where we grew up was farmland. So I had the best of both worlds. Um, a lot of people in Calumet City were Eastern European. Uh, we had a lot of uh, Poles, uh, a lot of uh, people who came from, uh, uh, I had a, a number of friends when I was growing up who were Mexican, uh, Croatian, Czechoslovakian, as I said, Polish. But in that whole mix, there was a huge uh, contingent of people from the South, Tennessee, Alabama, who had moved up to that area to get jobs. Uh, I can remember uh, one guy who was kind of my hero growing up. His name was Bill Clark. And um, Bill told me that when they moved up to Calumet City, he went to one of the mills to find a job. And he would, you know, didn't have anything down south. Uh, so they moved up to Calumet City. And he went and um, when he applied for the job, uh, they said, can you start this afternoon? And so that's how they were needing people. And, you know, those days are gone. But I just remember him saying that there was work was very plentiful, and so you had a, a lot of influx of um, not only people from uh, the south, but you know even uh, Mexico and again Eastern Europeans who were kind of what I would call fleeing the communist threat of the 1950s and the early 60s. So it was a really um, you know one of my uh, best friends or my first friends was a guy named Michael Kosakowski. So I, I learned how to uh, say very long uh, syllable names when I was growing up because of the influx of, of people from all over. Well, your name is spelled C-R-E-W-S. Correct. Is that an anglicized name? or? Well, um, we over the years, one of the little hobbies that uh, my family's had is doing genealogy, and it's Straight Cruise, which was an English name. I'd always been told by my uh, mother that we had some German in us, but several years ago through uh, uh, DNA checking, uh, I'm like 99.9% .9 English. Is that correct? Yeah, and so uh, I, in fact, very, very little minute bit of Irish, but it's really, um, um, English is my background. Yeah. yeah. Well, about 75% Scottish and English myself. A yeah. uh, little bit of Northern Germany. Yeah. Uh, so, where did you go in high school? I went to Thornton Fractional North, which is a strange name for a high school, um, but it was called TF North. Um, but I, I went uh, grade school to a place called Element, uh, Lincoln Elementary School. In fact, we lived uh, probably two blocks, and I was always envious of those kids who rode the bus to school because I thought that looked very exotic and fun because you know I could just walk to school, and here they came every day on a, a big yellow bus. But I went from kindergarten all the way to senior year in high school in two schools, and um, you know, there was a handful of us that we traveled all the way you know, uh, we were from kindergarten all the way up to senior year in high school. Was Indiana University had a famous basketball player, one of its more famous basketball players that played for Bobby Knight. Did he go to the same high school you did, Quinn Buckner? Well, no, he, I believe that Quinn Buckner was from the south side of Chicago or the um, Thornwood, Thorn Ridge. There were quite a few yeah, schools he, he went to one of the Thorntons, I thought. Yeah, I, um, in those south suburbs, there was a, a lot of uh, fantastic athletes. I mean, in my class alone at TF North, I think we had, uh, oh, five, I would say 450 to uh, 550 kids in the class. And um, so when you played football or basketball, you played a lot of schools. And, you know, when you have schools those size, you just have some just fantastic athletes. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. for sure. So you graduated from high school in... 1978? 1979. In fact, it, it, it's funny, it's, uh, that's a great guess because if I would have been born three days earlier, like I said, my birthday is December 3rd, and if I would have been born three days earlier, I would have been in the class of 1978, but I was, I was one of the older ones in my class, and I had a, a good class. In fact, I'm, um, I still am in contact with a lot of the uh, kids, you know, old people now, uh, yeah. that we went, all went to school together. Um, but my plan... Uh, when I was in high school, um, I wanted to go to the University of Florida because that sounded exciting. That sounded very exciting to me. Um, 
I guess I need to back up a second and kind of explain the situation. It's just that uh, my mother, I was raised by my mom, and uh, she met a, a gentleman in the early 1970s, and eventually in 1975 they were married, and his name was Carl Taylor. And so he, he was my stepdad. And so when late in uh, my high school time, in the late 70s, um, he was diagnosed with cancer. And I really felt um, like I couldn't uh, go to the University of Florida, go away from home. And so I ended up going to what was then known uh, as Thornton Community College, which is now South Suburban College in South Holland. And I went there for one year. And um, uh, from the time I was probably a junior in high school, I, uh, I worked, uh, went to school and also worked because there was a program called Distributive Education, sometimes known as DE. And uh, they basically, uh, we went to school half a day and then we worked a half a day. And I worked at a company called Edward C. Minus, which was a clothing store. And um, they, they're they located in Hamden, Indiana, but also in a, a River Oaks Small in Calumet City. And um, so I worked and uh, I thought, well, it makes sense to uh, go to school and maybe pursue education and business. Well, it didn't feed my soul because deep down, I've always had a passion for history. I've always enjoyed history, and I thought that I'd like to be a history teacher. So after completion, um, one year at Thornton Community College, I, uh, I was taking like economics and business classes and stuff like that. And I just, it, you know, it just didn't do it for me. And God bless those who can, you know, and who, who like that. So anyway, I needed, I really felt like uh, I needed to get away and go away to school. And I had some friends that went to Eastern Illinois University down in Charleston. Um, and so I ended up uh, applying, getting, getting accepted. And uh, that's where I, I left uh, to go to school in 1980 uh, in Charleston. And that's where I spent my entire time. I spent uh, four years there. So I was a, my college experience took five years to get through because not all of my credits from Thornton Community College transferred. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, uh, um, I went into television production because when you talk to the counselors and they're kind of directing you of what kind of major, I told them I wanted to be history, and they said, nope, we have plenty of history, uh, we have plenty of teachers, and uh, there's not going to be a job for you. Well, it's funny because today we have so few people going into teaching, and at that time there are so many. And so I, uh, I kind of, I thought, well, what else do I enjoy? And I just thought uh, I was never a really good English student, but I, I thought journalism, you know, that sounded kind of exciting. I knew nothing about it. I was not on my school paper in high school, but I just thought it, that sounded sexy, you know. So I ended up. Uh, becoming a journalism major and while I was at uh, Eastern they they built a radio and television center and so I kind of drifted off into the um, the communications area television production radio production and um, did that I, so I had a double major by the time I graduated of journalism and also uh, communications and so my first job was at uh, WTWO television in uh, Terre Haute, Indiana. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, I spent uh, about three and a half years there and um, enjoyed that a lot. In fact, um, uh, what was nice about being at WTWO, they let you do everything. You know, you and so anyway, I, I hadn't graduated from college yet, but my internship was over, so I went back to Calumet City and waiting to go back to Charleston to graduate in May. And I got a call from the TV station, and uh, one of the people there had uh, quit, gone back home, uh, someplace on the East Coast, and they asked me, would I be interested in her position? And I said, sure, you know. So I basically had a job uh, when I walked across the stage to get my diploma, uh, my undergraduate degree, I had a job at, at uh, TV2. And so that's, I began a career in television where I started off in what's called a continuity department, which I worked with the sales department and I helped uh, make commercials, organize the commercials, schedule the commercials. And then I eventually got into, um, uh, I never wanted to be on air. Uh, that was not one of my focus, but I liked being, where I liked working in television. And then I eventually became um, a salesman and I was in the sales department and um, I just thought I wasn't making enough money, so I jumped out of television. I worked for the Bemis Corporation uh, in Terre Haute. I was hired with uh, about 12 other uh, people to 
uh, kind of run their new concept of telephone sales. And uh, this is uh, by after well, our training program and after about uh, nine months, I just didn't, I wasn't feeling the passion, but I was salesman of the month. And I'm, uh, the guy that hired me, he was let go from the, uh, from the uh, company. And uh, we had a new uh, boss there, which um, uh, let's just say I was not, I didn't have a lot of respect for him. And so anyway, um, he ran things completely different. I really uh, admired and loved the guy that hired me. I thought he was terrific. And so anyway, I was salesman of the month and uh, I got called into the office of the new boss and he said, um, things aren't working out, we're gonna have to let you go. And I got fired from uh, that job. And uh, I took it very hard for a good 24 hours. And uh, then I realized, you know what? I hated that job. <laughs> and so I realized he did me the biggest favor. But uh, I've always had jobs. I, from the time I was, I think 11 or 12, I had a paper route. Um, a lot of people today, kids don't know what that is, but I do. yeah, you know what that is. And so yeah. I, papers were delivered to my house. I, uh, I worked for a company called the Sun Journal out of Lansing, Illinois. And they had Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturday morning papers. I'd get the papers delivered to me. I would roll them up, um, put them in my bag. I had uh, kind of a banana seat bike, uh, and uh, but the horns were in my bag went on. I went around and I uh, delivered the papers and collected the money from uh, the people who uh, subscribed to the paper. And I did that from, I think, from I was 12 years old and I had that job until I was 15. And then I, uh, I found uh, the grass was greener because I had a friend of mine who worked at Dairy Queen and says, we need you. So <laughs> my, I, had, I went to work for Dairy Queen and then eventually I went into the DE program and I worked in that clothing store. So I had worked for a long time, always had jobs. And when I was fired from that job, I, um, I took it really hard and personal. But then I realized, you know, you know God will do some, uh, some crazy things for you. You think, what are you doing? And all of a sudden he's, he, you find out that he's at work behind it, you know, so. I had a similar experience when I got out of college. Uh, I took a job in Terre Haute and uh, I worked about nine months when the boss called me in the office and said, my son just flunked out of Indiana University and he needs a job and I think he could do your job. Oh, so my. Yeah. 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 Well, in retrospect, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's funny how life can yeah. well, I change. Think, I, I think the lesson there is uh, I try to tell young people that the story because no matter what your plan is, you just never know and that um, I don't believe in a lot of dead ends. I think there's a lot of forks in the road. And if you'll take advantage of your situation, whatever, whatever road you take can be beneficial and can be life-changing and can, and just be, can right. be really good for you. Right. So you lived in Terre Haute while you were working there? I did. I moved to uh, Terre Haute uh, in 1984. Uh, the year I graduated from college and um, had a small apartment and I commuted um, the TV and if you work in television at first you don't make much money so I also worked um, I, they hired me at the old Godfather's Pizza at Town South Plaza because I was 21 and I could serve beer if someone came in and so um, uh, had a little short while I had a pizza career and that supplemented my income from working at the TV station so Okay, at some point along the line, you got married. Yeah, well, I'll tell, tell you. Tell us about that. Well, I, when I was attending Eastern Illinois University, several of the great uh, decisions of my life, number one, going to Eastern, because going there to school, um, it was a small enough campus that your teachers knew who you were, they cared for your welfare, they, um, they gave you great guidance, and they gave you great opportunity. Second, it was at Eastern Illinois University that I met this um, girl from this little town called Marshall, Illinois. And um, we started dating and um, continued to date after we graduated. And then uh, as I worked in television, I had, uh, if you're going to, when you work in television, it's kind of like a little bit of a gypsy. You're, you're here in this small TV market for so long that you, you bump to another one. And, you know, your goal is to get to a, a major TV market. Well, I, um, that wasn't my goal. And so I had to figure out, um, you know, if my, if, 
if this relationship between this young girl, uh, this Jesse Tingley, who I met in college, is going to continue, then I'm, I'm going to need to find some local em employment because I don't think she saw in her future of traveling around the country with uh, this knucklehead. But, uh, and so that was kind of the uh, idea for me to change jobs from the TV station to Bemis because it was a, you know, it was a local job. And so I remember that job um, was paying $20,000 a year. And I thought that, my gosh, that is just an unbelievable amount. That's, uh, I'm rich, you know? <laughs> and so um, I went there and uh, like I said, it didn't work out. And so um, uh, we did, we got married in uh, 1986. And uh, I loved uh, when the move to Marshall. I grew up in a metropolitan areas, um, suburbs of Chicago. I always loved watching the Andy Griffith show because I thought it was sweet, charming, and quaint. And I moved to a place that was sweet, charming, and quaint. And um, I've always joked, I've never meant this to sound like uh, I'm being insulting to the people or to the community itself, but I always looked at uh, Marshall as being a little bit like Mayberry, which is, you know, uh, people know know you, people know your business, and that's not a bad thing, you know, it's uh, yeah. because uh, it's been a real positive experience for me. I, I liked, uh, I did not grow up with my grandparents, I did not grow up around uh, a lot of cousins and a lot of um, aunts, or just a lot of relatives, but uh, my kids have, and I, I feel like if I've done anything right, that's one of the things I've done right, is that I, um, my kids had the opportunity to grow up here. Mm -hmm. So, 1986, you lived here almost 40 years. Yeah, uh, uh, one of the, the greatest compliments someone gave to me, I've been um, involved, I've, I've always met a lot of people, and I've been involved in the community, various things. But uh, someone came up to me one time, I think it was out at the soccer field, and they had said, um, Dan Cruz, I've got a question for you. He said, what year did you graduate high school? And I said, 1979. And she looked at me, and she just had this kind of blank, and she said, I have got to apologize to you. Um, I don't remember you in high school. And I said, well, I, I put my arm on her shoulder and said, well, I want to tell you why. It's because I didn't grow up here. And she had this dumbfounded look. She said, oh my gosh, it's like you've been here forever, <laughs> and, which was an, a compliment to me. Um, but yeah, I, uh, we, we, you know, that's how the people are, you know, yeah, and that's so funny. That's, uh, I, I always remember that. Yeah. So you and Jesse married uh, at Zion Church? We were. We, uh, we got married uh, August 30th, 1986 at Zion Church. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to believe, yeah, we're, we're knocking on the 40-year uh, anniversary here. And, yeah, uh, coming yeah, up pretty soon. Yeah, and uh, gosh, that's in two years from now. Yeah. So then you took a different job. Yeah, after I got fired from Bemis, I um, was looking for some place, and um, yeah, I had no idea what to do. And I thought, well, maybe I could jump, jump back into broadcasting somehow. And, you know, uh, I looked and looked, and I when I worked at TV2, I lived in Terre Haute, and I was living in Marshall, and I thought, that's a heck of a drive. Um, but uh, I had there was an opening at WKZI Radio in KZ, Illinois, run by John McDaniel, a small market radio station, and so I went and I applied, and I was a salesman for him for about a year, and um, just by a, a fluke, there was a job opening at Eastern Illinois University back at the Radio and Television Center where I had worked when I was a student, uh, an undergrad there at Eastern. And um, I thought I would apply for it, and I did, and uh, took the civil service test that you had to take at the time. And uh, by the time the, I got my scores back, and I had flunked the civil service test. And it, they had this little caveat of this area of what, what was wrong and why, why you didn't pass, and it said I had the inability to get along with people. And I just thought, now wait a second, that doesn't make any sense because that's not, that's not my personality. So I went and she said, now you have to understand, uh, I, I questioned why I flunked the test. And she said, um, uh, you have to understand this is kind of a standardized test. It's a, you know, it's, it's a state test. And it was does, an oral test. It, it, what's that? Oral test? No, it was a written test. Yeah, it was kind of like you just circle in and they, somehow they had some kind of schematic that kind of figured out what you did wrong. Mm. So um, she said, 
I'll t I, I looked and she goes, it's not that you, you gave bad answers. It's just that there was, of all the pages, there was one page where there was question, and it was a timed test. And I, I thought I had done it in the required time, but there was answer, or there was question in the back of um, one of the pages, and I didn't answer those. So the scorer read that as I was refusing to answer questions. Oh my goodness. So they had said, they said, okay, you can take it again. And I said, okay. So I did it. 30 days later, I took it again. And um, by that time, the job at, at the Reagan Television Center was taken. So there, was, there, there wasn't anything there. But they said, but there is an opening in the College of Fine Arts, and they are looking for a publicity specialist. And I said, well, I've never done a lot of publicity things, but you know, we covered public relations work in college and stuff, so I could probably figure it out. And um, they wanted to know if you uh, are skilled in computer work. And I really wasn't. I didn't have any community, community or I should, computer knowledge. So I, um, I went for the job and um, ended up being, again, a door opened for me that I had never expected. I basically, um, spent 32 years. I retired from that position uh, about three years ago. And um, that position grew over the years to where um, I was handling publicity. I ran an internship program. I was the director of a, um, an arts festival. I got to teach classes. Uh, I wasn't a full-time teacher, but I would teach one class a semester. So one semester I did teach two classes. And I loved it. it. I had a boss. My bosses have all been amazing people. And uh, unfortunately, over the years, I've, I've got to um, see them pass. But they, I can never really fully... Um, I always let those guys know, those my old bosses, because they were, they were bosses, but they, were, they also became very good friends. And I let them know how much that they changed my life. And a um, well, guy who initially hired me, a guy by the name of Vaughn Janicki at the College of Fine Arts. He was the dean of the college. And um, he gave me opportunities that I will forever be grateful for. And um, I, I, had the, I will tell you this. Um, out of all the people in the world, Steve, I want to let you know that of all the people in the world, I had the best job in the world. The best job in the world? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had the... And I, it was... Um, it was in Charleston. Um, I spent, you know, many years traveling the Clarksville Road uh, oh, wow. to Charleston, and um, you know, I you I were loved, on a lot of tires. Yeah, yeah, and I uh, I loved it, and it was a it was a blessing in my life, and um, I met some great people. I had, um, like I said, great opportunities. I served on boards, uh, planned um, conferences, and um, it what. The job was a publicity specialist. That was a, the civil service name. But I would always say that the best description, description of my job was that if the president came up with an idea, he would talk to the vice president, who was the provost of the university. The provost would talk to the dean, which was my boss. And the dean would put it on my desk. And I was like the special projects guy. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a couple of... Uh, one of my former bosses uh, said something to me one time. I'll, I'll, I, it's it's like an Academy Award. Uh, it's a, a great honor. He just said, if you're ever going to be in a foxhole, uh, Dan Cruz is the guy you want in your foxhole with me. Well, and that was an honor that you know, a quite a compliment. It was quite a compliment. And so I, um, I, I just had a great job. And it was it was Eastern Illinois University was a great institution. I loved the size. It wasn't one of these mega universities where. Um, there's you you knew people you know you you knew people at eastern and people they knew you and that's one of the things like uh, i always liked when i was a student there is just that you know what if you missed class for you know like two times in a row you're walking down the hall and the teacher that you missed that class he'd grab me and say where were you what are you doing you know mm -hmm. and that's they cared and that's uh, i've always liked that i've always had good feelings and thoughts about eastern myself uh mainly because my mother went there one year and lived in Penn Hall, yeah. oh, which yeah. still exists as a it's dormitory. The, well, I guess. It was the first residence hall in the state of Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was fortunate enough to meet uh, my wife, Carol, who was a, a, attended Eastern and graduated from Eastern. And uh, 
yeah, I, I really always thought, well, a beast now. Oh, me too, especially since I, 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 I met the, probably the most important person in my life there. Right. And I exactly. that, so that's a good thing about Eastern, you yeah. know. Well, let's talk about the family uh, that you and Jesse uh, created. Uh, you have three, two, two children? Three children. Three children? Yep, yep. we have our oldest son, uh, Nathan. Uh, Nathan uh, lives here in town with his wife, Allie, and their new baby, which is my first, or I should say Jesse's my, our first grandchild. And in fact, today she's five months uh, old. Uh, he is uh, a teacher at uh, Marshall High School. He teaches uh, English to uh, freshmen, and he also teaches a couple, a course or two for uh, writing courses for seniors. And then his wife, Allie, uh, she works at Indiana State. Yeah. My son, Landon, is married, lives in Chicago with his wife, and um, he works, um, gosh, I, I, I know the former company, but I can't remember the, the current company he's working for, but it's, a, it's in, rega in regards to um, um, assisting people, assisting businesses with uh, techno technological and, and computer issues and just kind of helping people in the business world kind of um, uh, get a right direction. And his wife, uh, Katie, uh, she works at the University of Chicago. And so um, my, my daughter, Emily, um, she lives in Nashville, Tennessee. She uh, works in the music industry and she travels quite a bit. She's, uh, 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 she manages an up-and-coming uh, sing, uh, singer-songwriter by the name of Ashley Cook. And so Emily um, is very busy. She has a very exciting career and it's fun keeping up with her and finding out where she's at. And she's had some wonderful experiences. And so what's nice is having one child here and a child in Chicago and a child in uh, in uh, Nashville, so that we can pick and choose. Who we can go north or go south, you know. Very convenient. Yeah, but the kids, um, they will uh, they will tell you that um, I'm not. I'm, I don't mean to put words in their mouth, but they they're very high on their hometown, you know. And so uh, it's not like they ever wanted to escape and say, "I got to get out of this town." Yeah. I think they. Um, in one sense, they always have a little bit of heartache, you know, that they're not living here. But you yeah. know, their their lives are, uh, their paths have taken them to different places. But they always have a, a sweet spot here for Marshall. Well, oh, that's good. Uh, while you're very busy traveling back and forth to Charleston in your job, uh, you're also pretty involved in community activities, uh, were you not? Plus, well, oh, several hobbies. Lots of hobbies. In yeah. fact, that's my um, my uh, retirement has been kind of probably to my wife's frustration is probably how many very hobbies I have. But uh, yeah, being involved with a number of things, I would probably say that starting um, uh, uh, I've been very involved with the Zion Zion Church, which is south of town, um, sometimes known as the old German church. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been uh, a member there since we were married in 1986, and then I've been the treasurer on occasion. I've been Sunday school teacher, so I've been involved with church activities uh, in a leadership role and, and uh, with various boards and things. Uh, for a number of years, I was on in in the Lions Club here in town. Um, presently, uh, I am involved with the historical uh, preservation group here in Marshall. Uh, that's also a, kind of a passion for me. Um, in retirement, uh, I am involved with the Marshall Leadership Team, Maine, the Marshall Area Youth Network, which we, uh, the uh, MLT works, uh, it works with high school students, and um, they plan different kind of uh, um, leadership programs for uh, each of the grades from freshman, sophomore, junior, and seniors. And so we have monthly meetings uh, with them, and that's been a very rewarding. And uh, my wife, uh, who worked in extension for many years through the 4-H program, um, was very, um, have, has always wanted to kind of uh, work with young people and kind of um, help them with leadership and just kind of, um, um, how you say, just, uh, I sometimes forget of how challenging and difficult those teenage years are, and sometimes it's good to have um, people just to volunteer and be mentors and just kind of help where they can and share our experiences with them. And so that's one of the things I'm involved in. Um, gosh, 
uh, hobbies over the years. As I had said that I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be specifically a history teacher. And that didn't pan out for me, but I've always had a passion for history. And um, over the years, uh, my, my interest in World War II has gone through various phases. Uh, when I was a child, it was watching the movies, reading the books. Um, that was phase one. Phase two was uh, collecting the paraphernalia, whether it was a, a military medal or a uniform or something like that. And um, phase three was interviewing the participants. And when I did my master's at Eastern, I did my master's in history that it didn't, it didn't do a thing for helping to improve my paycheck, but I did it for fun. You know, I didn't do it until out of an obligation for my career, but I had the opportunity to go to school for free. And so I thought, what would I enjoy? And I, it was history. And so um, for my, uh, my master's thesis, I interviewed World War II veterans. And in fact, the program in which you're working for today here at the library, all of those interviews are with um, this program that are archived here and ar archived in the state of uh, World War II veterans. And that's the third phase of talking to people because when I was growing up, I remember World War I veterans. And everybody was a World War II veteran when I was growing up, it seemed like, you know. And, but, um, you know, now today, we have very few. World War II veterans, right. no World War I veterans, mm -hmm. and um, I wanted to get some of their stories while I could. And uh, all those people that I interviewed for my master's, they're all now deceased. And that's the third phase. And the fourth phase is going to the places I've read about. So I've uh, taken probably oh, four trips to Europe, um, going to uh, Normandy, uh, going to Bastogne for the Battle of the Bulge, the D-Day invasion areas. The one place I haven't hit yet, it's on my bucket list, but um, my father was a World War II veteran, as well as my stepfather. And uh, my father went uh, from uh, Casablanca, North Africa, to Sicily, and to, up to Italy. And that's that's a trip I'd like to take up. Mm -hmm. That's on the bucket list, it'd yeah. be a good trip. I'd, I think I'd like to get uh, my stepbrother and I um, to do that trip sometime, it'd be kind of fun. But um, that's, and I still, I'm still collecting uh, military items to this day, specifically European, what we call the ETO, the European Theater of Operations. I'm, um, uh, although I'm, I'm slightly interested in what happened in the Pacific, uh, what happened in Europe is big enough and right. takes up a lot of my time. Yeah. But, uh, but like I said, history is uh, kind of a passion. So this, uh, two years ago, I got to go to the Little Bighorn uh, for the first time, and um, my favorite battlefield here in the United States is probably Gettysburg. Yeah, and um, uh, I think so too. Yeah, it's my favorite. Yeah. Uh, one of the places in Europe you might want to visit if you have not is uh, the cemetery, the U.S. cemetery in Luxembourg. Oh, I've been there. Yeah. Well, have you? Yeah, I sure have. Yeah, it's okay. where uh, Patton is buried. Where General Patton was yeah. buried. Yeah. Right. In right. fact, uh, several years ago, cousins of my wife, the Guard family, Danny Guard and his sons. Uh, Seth and Jacob, along with my sons uh, Nathan and Landon, we were there, and we were able to we wrote we raised the flag there at the, at dusk mm -hmm. at that um, in Luxembourg. Yeah, I always thought the inter the story about why Patton is buried there is he was killed I think in Austria you know, in a car wreck, but he wanted to be buried with his troops. Right. So I guess m many of the uh, Battle of the Bulge. Uh, uh, Guys that were killed in the Battle of the Bulge are buried there in that cemetery. It's a it's an awe inspiring event because you look at those guys and you know there's just not a couple of dozen crosses there. There's just hundreds, hundreds of crosses there, and and that's just one battlefield out of many. And you just think of all those guys. On the average, they were the ages of uh, 18 to 23, mm -hmm. and all of those guys. I um, not to be over dramatic, but all those guys there and girls, women. Um, they gave all of their tomorrows for our today, you know. So I, I, I have a, a really admiration and uh, I have deep reverence for that place. I've heard that you have a whole room filled with paraphernalia. I do. Or two. I do. Yeah, I uh, have uh, uh, I have a basement that um, is full of stuff. I've got uh, probably about. 
21 mannequins of different uniforms. A lot of the things I've collected over the years, people have been very kind to me and, and giving me things. And I feel like I'm an, um, I feel like I'm an archivist. Archivist, is that the word? And that, uh, especially uh, from people from uh, Clark County, Marshall, uh, people have been very kind because either their kids don't want it or they don't know what to do with it. And they say, well, um, Dan will take care of it. And so I have a number of uniforms from local veterans here that um, I, I cherish and I really highly respect. Um, I want to I honor them. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, I've, um, in uh, 2018, I went with a couple of historians to, uh, uh, to France. And I, part, I was partly the driver uh, driving the van because I, I felt comfortable doing that. And we went to a number of places. And one of the guys that I met there was a guy by the name of Jos Groen. And basically, that he's a, he was a, a lieutenant colonel in the Dutch Army. And we became fast friends. We met the, during that, uh, that tour. And uh, we became, in fact, he's come to Marshall several times really? since that, since that uh, 2018. And he was also an author. And he's written several books. And I was uh, fortunate enough that he wanted me to edit two of those books. And so I've, um, he and I have worked closely. He wanted to make it sound more American, more, you know, more natural. And so, because, I mean, his English is so much better than my Dutch. But, you know, I could, I could help him out. And so those were very rewarding projects that I felt would have never happened if I didn't have the opportunity to travel to uh, France and uh, to Belgium and also Germany. Who were some of the local veterans that you interviewed? Well, uh, Dr. George Mitchell. Um, uh, Raymond Miller used to be uh, mayor here at one time. Um, uh, Dick Metzger. Uh, uh, da, 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 let's see. Um, Connie Richardson, uh, who mm. uh, worked at the high school cafeteria for many years. She mm. was a, a WAC, uh, mm. um, which is War Women's Ar Ar Army Corps. Um, and um, gosh, uh, Max and Ann Shaw. Um, gosh, you put me on the spot here real quick. Uh, Bill Tingley, uh, my father-in-law was, um, my, my father-in-law was, was Guy Tingley. He had a brother, Bill Tingley, um, Gene Tingley, and also Carl Tingley, four brothers who all served in World War II, and luckily they all came home. And um, so uh, I interviewed them. And um, that was, you know, uh, sometimes... Uh, they weren't that um, thrilled about sitting down talking about it, um, especially with a recorder going on. And um, Bill Tingley is one that I'll always remember that um, I wish I was smart enough at the time that when I recorded him, I saw him kind of looking at me and his eyes would dart back to the recorder. And I would, I, so he saw when we kind of ended our interview, I, I went over and turned the recorder off. And it was then that he opened up more. And I wish I would have kind of misled him in a way thinking that I turned it off so he could relax a little bit and he told me more and so um, it's always interesting because these guys you know really some of the first time that they were away from home and, yeah, yeah. and the experiences and again as I mentioned there are so you know there's so few World War II veterans and most of the veterans who are alive today are what you'd call replacement divisions or they were from re replacement divisions or they were late war veterans and some of them didn't see combat. They were just there during the occupation or the cleanup of the area. So they, uh -huh. they weren't in the, what you would call the thick of it, you know. Right. But. Uh, I, uh, I accompanied uh, Mary Ferris. Did yeah. you interview her? I, I certainly did. Mary Ferris is, in fact, Mary Ferris uh, probably... Um, we did a, a friend of mine by the name of Jeff Beauchart. We uh, we did this special program we put together called the Women of Valor, and so we we took people like Mary Ferris, who um, was one of her responsibilities was setting up hospitals mm -hmm. um, in England and then eventually in France, and uh, just a. a unbelievable experience. But we we took um, and we honored all these women. Um, who were either Marines or in the Navy or uh, you, you, you name it. In fact, I have all the materials at home still that we could do an exhibition 
you know, like that because I have photos and I have a lot of the, um, uh, the things from these women they put towards this exhibition we used. But we went around to libraries and different community centers and they, they were all on a panel. And Mary was just, had a wonderful, wonderful memory. And if you'll remember, she was, um, I think she passed after her 100th birthday. Yes, she did. And so she was just very knowledgeable, you know. And, yeah. I accompanied her to Washington, D.C. on, uh, now I can't think of the name of the program. Uh, yeah, where you go to the World War II Memorial? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Veterans are, are taken to, uh, to see the, the World War II Memorial. Well, now they're in Vietnam, even the Vietnam veterans. Sure. Are yeah. Going, but, uh, yeah, I was uh, fortunate enough to escort her. I think I was called a guardian. Yeah. I don't know why. Ever That's an honor. Guardian. That's a real honor for you. Uh, yeah. But uh, it was quite a trip to see. She, you know, she, she got pretty emotional. Uh, oh, yeah. She, she told me a story one time that, um, that they knew the invasion, the D-Day invasion, was going to be happening at some point. And leading up to that, you know, there was, everyone was on pins and needles. And Mary said that she was in, her, in the tent where she was at and uh, on the, wherever base it was. And she was laying on her back and she was sleeping and she heard the planes. And so that was the paratroopers that were leaving to head over to the jump. And she said it was, you know, it was around midnight. And they, at the, you would hear planes and cars and trucks all the time. But on this particular night, the, the night of June 5th or early June 6th, 1944, she heard, a, she heard the planes. And they, everyone knew. They, the women in the tent, they all got up and they were all just kind of on their elbows. And they said, this is it. And it was shortly, probably about a month after that, that Mary left England to go over to France to set up those hospitals mm -hmm. that would take care of the, the wounded. So, crazy story. Well, you've had quite a active life, uh, and you're still active. Uh, what's going on now in your life? Well, um, I am... Uh, <laughs> Since I retired, uh, I've got three jobs, um, three part-time jobs. Number one, on occasion, I will substitute at the high school, and I really um, uh, value that. I've for as a the, teacher. Uh, yes, uh, for the past 16 years, I've been sitting on the Marshall School Board, and uh, it's been a very rewarding experience. And it's been uh, also extremely rewarding to be um, in the classroom, and I, I'm not wearing my school board hat, but getting to see what our teachers, you know, getting to see classrooms from their eyes. And I know I'm not getting a true picture because I'm not there all the time, but that's been very interesting to me um, to, to see st the students of, the current students in school. And, um, and we've got a good school system here in Marshall. I basically am at the high school and also occasionally at the uh, junior high. So that's one job. My other job is I work part-time for Knowles Auction here, uh, help cleaning out houses and catalog sales. And then my third job is kind of one, another passion of mine is music. I run, I have a little radio program here on WMMC called the Rock and Roll Masterclass with Dan Cruz on uh, Monday, the, the first and third Saturday of every month from nine to noon. And I just play uh, a lot of my old albums and- On WMMC? WMMC, yeah. I did not know that. Well, this Saturday, uh, is there'll be the Halloween show, Steve. Really? Yeah. yeah. 9 o'clock till 12. 12, yeah, 9 to 12. I take requests. And what's nice is that uh, our local radio station uh, is owned and operated by uh, Joey and uh, Kelsey O'Rourke. And the, you know, no matter where you live in the world, you can listen to the radio station from Marshall, Illinois. And I have um, uh, I've had listeners from the Netherlands. Uh, I've had uh, listeners, uh, people in England. Uh, uh, Louisiana. Some people used to live here in uh, uh, Marshall are now living in Louisiana, and Arkansas, and so uh, yeah, it's I. Uh, How is that possible? It's just crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. w, you just go to your computer and type in wmmcradio.com, and you'll see listen live and oh, so, yeah. and listen on your computer. Yeah, you listen to your okay. computer. Yeah, so well, that, it's been great fun. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, when you were in high school and college, uh, computers weren't a thing then. No, not and, at all. And so how, how has life changed for you? For you, uh... you know, 
in kind fifth, of keeping fifth, up with technology. I can remember in fifth grade that um, my I had to get a computer, and I remember it was unbelievable. But I think that not a computer. I'm sorry, a calculator. And we needed a calculator for school. And I remember my parents paid, it was like 70 or $80 for this back in 1972, 73, which was, you know, I was really warned and threatened at the inch of my life not to get, let anything happen to this computer or this calculator. And so I didn't have uh, really any computer experience in high school. I don't remember much computer. I remember data processing cards first year of college and I was totally lost. Either people understood it or they didn't or how that worked. But then when I uh, went to work at, Eastern, they had a, a, an Apple Macintosh computer, and I had uh, 32 gigs of RAM on that. <laughs> and I remember people used to come to my office to take a look at it because they couldn't believe how much RAM was on that computer. And um, I have uh, i don't know, I've never been very successful operating an IBM, but I've always used Macs and uh, Apple products. And... Um, even to this day, I have an iMac and I love it. And it just kind of amazes me of what all the information, because there's more information in, your, in the phone that you and I carry than got us to the moon in 1969, which is crazy. But um, I would say that I am not overtly adept at um, uh, technology, but I would like to, I, uh, I surround myself who, with people who are. Uh, for many years, I ran a, a DJ business on the side uh, where we play dances and on the weekends and stuff. And so um, I've always been around um, people who have those skills. I've been fascinated because it doesn't come naturally to me. I just have to learn something a hundred times. You know, I have to be, I have to be shown something a hundred times so I'll finally get up how, how it works. But, uh, but yeah, technology is an amazing thing. I, I love what my phone can do. I love what my con computer can do. And just like, but I think also you need to, know how to do it yourself. You don't, don't always rely on your technology to kind of get you through because one day, if you don't know how to do the basic and simple math, you're not going to be able to, to rely on your phone. You know? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm a lot older than you, and uh, yeah, I, I kind of long for the old days. Oh, when, yeah. When you, could, when you had a, a, pro a service problem and you needed to talk to somebody, you could reach somebody. Yeah. I now have uh, situations where the computer that I'm, that answers the phone says we don't have conversation capacity anymore. You have, I, to, get, you have to enter a website of some sort. To, if there's anything that I despise about the current um, world is the fact that um, we have lost the ability to talk to one another and to find out. You know, we rely on some kind of um, Surrey or some kind of, you know, as you said, you know, you can ask a question and you get this kind of um, AI, artificial intelligence kind of response. And yeah. it's, they're not really answering your question, but they're mm -hmm. answering it around, you know. Right. So that's frustrating to me. It is know? to me too. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you lived through a lot of history, you know, your lifetime, uh, a lot of stuff has gone on. What, what stands out during historical events? Uh, um, I said about this the other day that um, several things. I mean, when uh, of course 9/11, um, when we when we had we just recently had the anniversary of that, and um, I find com myself compelled just to watch all that again because I remember I was on my way to work and uh, that morning of 9/11, um, seeing it, the first initial accident that happened to World Trade Center, one of the one of the towers, and they thought it was just a plane, uh, unfortunate plane accident, which happened also many, many years ago with the um, Empire State Building, a plane crashed into it. So, but then after that, when you found the second one, and then you found that the, you know, the, um, Washington, D.C. Uh, was attacked, and then that was, you know, those, moments kind of things changed it was like uh also um i remember remember the big deal it was that it didn't turn out to be a big deal but um uh, when we went from 1999 to 2000 what the scary you know how that was going to turn y2k yeah but i also um 
You know, I, I distinctly remember, uh, I, I have no memory of John F. Kennedy being assassinated. Well, yeah, you were but a little I do, bit too young to remember. But I do remember when um, George Wallace was uh, assassinated, uh, Anwar Sadat, the president of uh, Egypt, for those kind of things, uh, being a journalism major, they kind of stopped mm -hmm. um, uh, for me. Um, uh, pop culture-wise, I remember when, you know, John Lennon was killed. Those were kind of... You know, big for my, you know, for my generation, you know, um, but uh, I, I guess, you know, 9-11 was uh, something that was, uh, I guess it made me think that we're not as safe here in the United States as we used to be, you know, as the world has uh, gotten smaller because of technology and also the, the amount of people and, you know, everybody is vulnerable. And I think that's the thing that... Um, I realized at that point, it's just that we are all vulnerable. For many years in the United States, we were so separated from the rest of the world that things couldn't happen to us. I mean, you know, historically wise, it was when they, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, it was still, Pearl Harbor was far away from the mainland here, but it seemed, seemed so far away. But then when 9-11 happened, we just knew that um, it could happen. You know, I can remember being a little bit scared because of, uh, we lived in near Chicago, another big city, and also we lived next to one of the biggest refineries in the entire world, just several miles south of Marshall, that could be a target, you yeah. know. So, but yeah. Um, well, you were you you were just a kid during the Vietnam War. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. None of your relatives, uh, your dad or your... My dad enemies. was out of the service at that time, but my two mm -hmm. older brothers um, were in Vietnam. They were? Uh, my oldest brother, Donald, uh, was at Way uh, in 1968 during the Tet Offensive. Mm -hmm. And then my brother, Daryl, was in Vietnam in uh, 1970 and 1971. So um, the Vietnam War did, you know, hit our family because... Uh, I had a brother-in-law, my sister's uh, husband was in Thailand at the time, and then my other sister, her husband, although he wasn't in Vietnam, he was sent to England, but all of that military experience, you know, it was during that time when mm -hmm. there was a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, um, yeah, the Vietnam is, it's hard to believe that that has been, gosh, from Vietnam into 1975, so it's, you know, we're looking 50 years ago. You know, it's. I was just thinking the same thing about 9/11. That it's coming up on a quarter of a century here. Yes, it is. Ago. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, you had two brothers in Vietnam. Did your mother? I don't know if this was a custom then or not. Did they have banners that they hung in the window that were stars? We, to we, did, we did not have one, but I remember neighbors across the street. In fact, our neighbor, uh, she had th a, star, a flag with three stars, and just down the block was a woman with a single star, and it was a gold star. So she was a gold star. Mother. So oh, she, yeah. she lost a child there yeah. in, in Vietnam. I ask because, uh, like you, I was the youngest of five by a long shot. And my two oldest brothers uh, served in World War II. So I remember my mother had uh, a banner with two blue stars. Mm -hmm. And then later, a gold star because her son-in-law, my, my sister was the oldest in the family. Her husband was drafted in May of 1945. And right after basic training was sent to Okinawa. Oh. And he was killed in the battle for Okinawa. Oh so, gosh, and so and so and so close to the end of the war. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. Uh, it was. What's funny, uh, uh, not funny, but um, interesting about that is that my boss, the guy that hired me at Eastern, his older brother was also killed at Okinawa. Oh well. Yeah, you know. So it's just, you know, it's. Um, I can't imagine. Uh, you know. I, I, I think of my kids and um, love my kids to death, but I also, um, it, it's funny when you look at your grandkids, how much um, love and compassion you have for them and you just don't want to ever see them to be hurt. Yeah. And how, how gut-wrenching and how do you ever process that as a parent, you know? And mm -hmm. God bless those who, um, who 
are forced into that situation. It's very unfortunate and very sad. You know? Well, uh, we've talked about modern conveniences and how they've helped your life. Uh, yeah, we're, we're sitting in, in 2024, and I gotta tell you, Steve, I'm still crazy impressed with the fax machine, and the fax machine's been around for 40 years. <laughs> You know, but how do you, you know, so it's like some of the technology today, it just kind of blows the mind. I mean, it, you know, as you had, had alluded to, it's interesting how someone can listen to the local radio station living over parts of the world. But I remember what a big deal it was back in the late 60s when uh, my mother would try to talk to my sister who was living in Germany at the time. And I can remember when we were talking on the phone, they sounded like they were so far away and there was an occasional beep, which was that uh, undersea transcontinental line that they mm -hmm. were using for mm -hmm. phone. And, you know, today, I, can, I, I will talk with my friend in the Netherlands and it's like he's in the next room. It's just, the technology is just crazy. Mm -hmm. So we live in a, you know, I sometimes I, I, I yearn for the, uh, the good old days, but I'm telling you what, there's the things that are in our life, whether medical things or just technology and convenience things, it's, it's amazing. You just wonder what could possibly be next. Yeah. It's kind of scary. Right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, anything else you have in mind that uh, you wanted to mention? I was just going to say, um, uh, when you had contacted me about uh, see if I'd be interested in this, you know, I was just kind of like I have, I have nothing to say, but I do thank you for the opportunity to sit down and talk with you a little bit about this because um, my wife was asking me, well, how are you preparing? I said I am not. I just want to kind of be as candid and straight, and I have no idea what we're going to talk about, but um, it's been a, it's been an honor to sit down and talk with you. Oh. Uh, I actually sought you out. Uh, you actually don't like quite fit the criteria that uh, and it's kind of applies to the project in terms of when it started. You know, they wanted uh, people who grew up and lived in Marshall for a long sure. time and could talk about the old days. Sure. But uh, I, I wanted to talk to you because I find you a very interesting person and someone who uh, grew up elsewhere, but uh, uh, you've immersed yourself in, uh, in the, Marshall and uh, the community and raise your family here. And I it's, thought it, it's, it's been a privilege. It needed to be passed on. Well, I want to say uh, this, just that one of the things that I have done when I taught classes and on occasion when I get afforded the opportunity to, to, to speak to our, our students here at Marshall High School, and I say this to anybody, that um, the road that will bring you to Marshall will also take you to any place else you want to go. And I encourage people, uh, I've always in, encouraged students, I said, you know, before you get bogged down in a job, and before you get bogged down, and I shouldn't say bogged down, before, but before you have the responsibilities of uh, a spouse and children, I said, see the world. It'll change your life. I agree. And, um, travel and, uh, and go to the center of town someplace and sit and just watch it and, and soak it in. And I said, then you will come home and you will appreciate and love your community more than anything. Not because we're better, it's just because you see how other people live. And so I just really um, think that's important to um, get out there and um, this is every place you want to or you ever dreamt about going, you can go to. And those, like I said, those roads will also bring you back home. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, when Carol and I retired, I lived in DuPage County, mm -hmm. uh, earned my livelihood there. And uh, when we retired, we decided to move back to Marshall instead of Florida or wherever we retirement people go. Uh, just because I, I read the newspaper about what was going on in Marshall at the time and how uh, uh, programs like Maine and uh, uh, Main Street and so forth were going on and I thought, well, Marshall sounds like it's uh, trying to keep from winding up like some of the other little towns yeah, around there yeah. that uh, just don't keep up and eventually fall apart. Well, I, so, I, I, I guess the, 
one of my things is just that I've seen a lot of little towns go by the wayside because um, either people want to tear down what they're, you know, what's in town. And I, we've got some buildings that are in bad shape here in Marshall, but I think we should do everything in our path, in our power to preserve them, even if they cost more than what the building's worth. Because once they're gone, they're gone. Your history is gone. And you can say, over there is where this building used to stand. But I am, um, that's one of the things why I'm involved with the historical preservation, because uh, you're beginning to see, and people are beginning to, re you know, receive the reward of saving our, our community. Because um, there's a lot of communities that their past is gone and there's nothing that they can do to bring that yeah. back. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Marshall was a great deal of uh, grat gratitude to a few select people uh, who like built this library, yep. made it the yep. way it is. This is a gem. Our library yeah. here is a, is a gem and yeah. uh, I know that people when they've come in here they've been like blown away because of the programming that you guys have done over the years mm -hmm. and just you know what, what we have because it's yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah. When we were in the Sonny Daly room, uh, I knew Sonny Daly. He was a year ahead of me in high school and uh, this room is dedicated to him because his will uh, left $100,000 to the wow. Marshall Public Library, which has gone, helped, you know, make it the way it is right now. So. That's a great tribute to him, that old uh, high school sweater, his Letterman sweater. Yeah. 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 Well, with that, uh, can we wind this up? Are you ready? Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Let's see if we can turn this off. <laughs> Push the square button.